Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm Wendy Cutler with the Asia Society Policy Institute, and we're pleased that you're able to join us for what we believe is going to be a very interesting webinar focused on the U.S. presidential election and specifically what the impact of the outcome may have on the U.S. trade and economic security agenda for the Indo-Pacific region. We are now less than 50 days away from the U.S. presidential election, and to say it's a tight race is really an understatement. The outcome of our election will have an impact on U.S. relations with Indo-Pacific nations in many ways, including in the security, political, technology, and economic areas. But today, we'll be focusing on the impact on U.S. trade and economic security policy. For example, we have heard in the campaign a lot of talk about tariffs, both those that might be applied exclusively to China, but also those that may be applied to a broader group of trading partners. We're also at a juncture where supply chains are shifting all around the region and around the world, and this will need to be a focus of whoever comes into the White House. There are also questions about the future vitality of the Indo-Pacific Economic um, Framework Agreement, including whether it will survive and also whether a trade pillar can be successfully negotiated. And many believe that US leadership in the WTO and more broadly on international trade and economic policy has been severely lacking in recent years with the US ignoring many of the rules that frankly, we work to create with others. To help unpack these and other related questions, we've got a great group of folks joining us, both from the United States, but also importantly from Asia. Let me briefly introduce the panel. Um, we're pleased that Greta Pesch could join us. She's currently a partner at a law firm here in Washington but is known to the trade community more for her um, hard work when she was at the Senate Finance Committee, but also as general counsel of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. Welcome, Greta. Um, Cleet Willems um, is a partner at Aiken Gump um, Law Firm, but was previously deputy assistant for international economics to President Trump, worked at USTR and also in Congress and has been my partner on many um, writing and programs in the past. So welcome, Cleet, glad you could join us. We are thrilled um, for our Asia partners to invite former trade minister, Gita Wirjawan, um, to our panel. Um, he is now chairman of the Ankara Group, um, an Indonesian business group with interest in real estate, technology, arts, um, and natural resources. And I think many of us got to know him when he was minister, trade minister from 2011 to 2014, where when Indonesia not only hosted a WTO ministerial, but also hosted APEC. And finally, we welcome from Japan, Takamasa Sekine, a professor in the Graduate School of International Social Sciences at Yokohama National University, where he focuses his research on international trade. So thank you to the stellar panel. We're gonna get right to questions, but before that, let me just um, allow the audience to know that we'll do our best to incorporate your questions into our panel discussions over the next hour. So feel free to put them into either the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and I would just encourage you, the shorter the question, the better, and um, frankly, the more, the more willing I will be to ask your question as it's so hard to read through long text when you're trying to moderate a panel as well. So with that, let's get right to our discussion and maybe I can start with our US panelists to kind of give us a, a sense of where we are on these issues in the campaign. So, Cleet, maybe I can start with you. Um, with respect to the Trump campaign, we've seen a lot of proposals with respect to hiking tariffs. Some of them seem to be aimed at China. Some of them are aimed more broadly. Some of them seem to be across the board. Some are targeted on specific products. Um, 
but perhaps you can give us a sense of um, how we should look at the all of these proposals, which ones we should be paying the most attention to, and maybe you can also give a sense, given your legal background, in terms of which of these proposals would congressional um, approval be needed. Over to you, Cleet. Sure. Thanks so much, Wendy. And, and, and you started with a really easy question, which <laughs> is to try to quickly summarize and distill President Trump's trade policy. But let me let me do my best here. I mean, I, I think first you need to start with objectives and, and, and what is the president trying to achieve with some of these uh, concepts. I mean, I think it really does come down to a couple of things. Um, and, and, and quite honestly, I do think in some respects, these are bipartisan objectives um, that also um, are there for the, the Biden-Harris camp, even if they don't have the precise same proposals. And that's number one. I do think that there is this um, strong interest in uh, trying to um, trying to make sure we're making more in America. I mean, quite frankly, the president wants more things made in the United States and uh, does feel that using tariffs is one way to achieve that. I think number two, there is this question of unfairness. And if you really look at global trade rates around the world, you know, the US is very low. And I wanna just give one example here that I think um, underscores some of the problems with the current international trading system. And that's the way that tariffs are handled at the WTO. And right now, you know, for those trade nerds who are on, you know, the difference between bound and applied rates, but basically um, applied rates are what we apply today. Bound is the maximum we're allowed under the international trading system. Well, the WTO right now, the U.S. applied rate, what we apply today is around 3.4%. And the maximum we can go up to is 35 or it might be 3.3 and 3.4, but it's roughly around three and a half. And we have no flexibility to go over that or we're out of compliance with the WTO. On the other hand, you have someone like India where their applied rate is around 18 and their bound rate is around 50. So, I mean, imagine any of you walking into the Oval Office and talking to President Trump and say, this system makes sense. We're at 3.3 and if we go to 3.5, we're, we're out of compliance with the system. India, on the other hand, is at 18 and if they go to 50, wow, that's fine. I mean, it just it, it is a system that I think is out of date. And so I think what President Trump is doing is trying to raise this question about do we need to update this system? Uh, I think a lot of this is all you know related to that is reciprocity. But then beyond that, I think you go to a question of um, trying to open up other markets, trying to use tariffs as leverage, um, something that we haven't seen a lot out of out of the Biden team. Um, and that's part of the equation. And then finally, an area where I think there's a lot of overlap between Republicans and Democrats is um, this question of diversifying supply chains away from China. So those are the objectives. And, and in order to achieve those objectives, President Trump is throwing a lot of ideas on the table and the way that I look at this is, as I tell folks, take this all seriously. I mean, he's very willing to raise these tariffs, but don't necessarily take them literally and assume that every single proposal is going to happen as it is currently described, because he's throwing ideas out there um, sometimes to sort of get a reaction, also sometimes to start a dynamic for a negotiation. And so you'll see some of the Trump advisors on TV and one of them will say, oh, we're doing the 10 percent, you know, day one. And the other one will say, oh, it's just a negotiating tactic. And people say, who's right? And I say they're both right. <laughs> they're both right because President Trump's going to throw this out there. He's going to see what the team's able to get. And then he's going to make a decision. Do I think that tariff is better for America or do I think uh, that that deal is better for America, and that's where we're going to go. So I can't sit here today and predict for you, Wendy, exactly which ones are going to happen and what are not. I suspect that some will happen. I suspect that you will definitely get some targeted tariffs. Uh, I think, um, you know, looking at reinstituting the DST investigations, looking at raising well, tariffs just DST China, for the uh, digital services taxes, you know, which were directed at France and others. I would look at um, China phase one enforcement. I think there'll be more targeted tariffs to achieve that. And then beyond that, I think the president will talk about the, the broad tariff and reciprocity, and then we'll see what happens. Um, and then lastly, on your question about Congress, you know, some of this can definitely be done by the executive branch. I mean, both um, Trump and Biden have shown you can use 301, you can use 232, you can move them up, down, and around 
uh, with a lot of flexibility. So I expect most can be done that way. I think there's an open um, legal question about the best way to handle something like at 10%. And I think, again, if anyone comes on here and he tells you unequivocally, it's easy to do it on the world under IEPA, or you definitely can't do it, I think they're they're both wrong. It's, it's some, somewhat of an untested legal question. And, and depending on how surgical it is, which countries it applies to might dictate whether uh, it would be permissible under IEPA or not. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a, an evolving process. I think you could clearly do it if you had congressional authority. And then I think the design would matter quite a bit if you're trying to do it unilaterally. But this is this is an untested area. Um, one follow up question, Cleet, and that is the 60 percent tariff pr proposal with respect to China. My understanding is that 60 percentage points would be added to current tariffs, and many of them are 25 percent. So you're really talking about tariffs kind of approaching 100 percent. Vis-a-vis China, do you think the objective there is to get China back to the negotiating table? Or do you think it's just more punitive at this time to accelerate a move towards more decoupling from China? I mean, I, I wouldn't characterize it as punitive in any context, but I, but I would say I think the objectives are probably uh, multiple. Uh, I do think on, on one level, there is interest certainly among, among the Trump camp in, in, in the concept of strategic decoupling and protecting the market, especially in areas where there is excess capacity. And so I think that's pretty consistent, honestly, uh, with what the Biden folks have tried to achieve, where I think there's a big gap and a big difference between Biden and or Harris uh, and Trump is that I also think Trump is using these for negotiation leverage um, and, and may have some interest in trying to further up, open up China's market. The way I see it playing out is that there will be certain areas that are sort of the no-go areas where the tariffs will ramp up will probably approach lockout tariffs. And then there will be other areas where it's it's we feel it's safe to engage. It's more commoditized products, agriculture, you know, things like that, where there will be attempts to open up markets. So you'll have sort of this bifurcated approach. On one hand, we're decoupling strategically. On the other hand, we're trying to maximize trade in the areas that we think it's okay. Okay, Greta, now over to you. Cleet's put a lot on the table. He's emphasized areas where there may be alignment between policies or at least objectives of the policies between Vice President Harris and President Trump. So maybe you can comment on that, but also highlight some of the differences, particularly with respect to whether a tariff approach should be more targeted or an across the board approach could achieve our objectives. Over to you, Greta. Thank you. I, I think Clint's right. There's a lot of bipartisan consensus um, on trade, particularly though around China. And I think getting um, when you get away from that, it gets a little bit more of a of a gap. So you know, he mentioned um, interest in making more things in the United States. Absolutely, that's a bipartisan uh, objective. It's been a focus of the Biden administration. And it's something that they've used not just tariffs and, and the increase uh, on uh, certain products through the four-year review of, um, uh, of the 301 tariffs uh, it is related to those things we want to make in the United States, EVs, EV batteries, chips, et cetera, things that we're also using the tools um, in the IRA and the CHIPS Act to further. So it's, it's a both and, um, and not just tariffs uh, in the Biden administration. I think there's also bipartisan um, consensus on this issue of supply chain resiliency, which means a lot of things, right? It's a short term, but it can mean um, a lot of different product areas, a lot of different types of problems, but there is just a lot of concern um, and activity around that that we've all seen. And then I think on this question of unfairness, I think, uh, yes, there's bipartisan consensus there, but really more around China. and. Um, not around the rest of the world as much as, as the Trump administration is talking about. So and that unfairness comes from looking back on our experience with China, seeing that they've been able to build up um, non-market excess capacity in uh, not just steel and aluminum and in some of these sectors we've seen so much um, in, but and now more and more in EVs, in chips, um, in solar, 
And that that's a fundamental unfairness that is undermining uh, our, our US economy, um, our, our supply chain resiliency and our, our partners and allies too. Um, so in that strategy about what to do about China, you do see the Biden administration, I think you would anticipate a Harris administration putting more focus on working together with our allies and partners to address the big uh, challenges we have from, from China and its global impact, right? It's not, there's only so much you can do to, um, to, to remedy and um, start to address uh, China's buildup of capacity on a bi bilateral basis, right? Because even though we're a, a very big economy, China is too, and their products go all over the world, and that's going to impact us in our market. And so, you know, I think that um, uh, you can see from, from Vice President Harris that she also has more of an emphasis on allies and partners. I think her experience as Vice President um, going around the world, uh, meeting and working with partners um, will, will underscore and, and continue that interest in, in using um, those networks and various configurations to try to come up with new new ways to address this issue. And I think it does, it is something that, again, on a bipartisan basis, um, there's a sense that the trajectory we had been on with China wasn't working. That engagement at the WTO, engagement through um, various bilateral um, fora and work streams, it, it didn't work, that we had to try something else. And there's various versions of what that something else is, I think that you're seeing proposed by the two uh, campaigns. Follow up, Greta. And that is, um, people are speculating that maybe Vice President Harris, given her background, may be interested in putting more emphasis on the nexus between climate and trade, sustainability and trade, as well as some of the emerging technologies, AI and digital. Can you comment on both of those areas and whether you think we may be seeing some um, you know, new proposals or um, you know, new directions in our trade policy going forward if she were to win? I think that that's uh, something that definitely we can anticipate. And I think that the groundwork, particularly on climate and trade, has been laid in, in the Biden administration. Uh, we have um, seen a lot of interest and a lot of thinking, um, if not a lot of outcomes on, uh, on climate, particularly a, a potential border measure in the Biden uh, administration. And we see that interest also growing and spreading on the Hill uh, with respect to carbon border measures of, of various types. So there's a really great uh, groundwork that's been done. Um, the uh, Podesta's task force that was announced earlier this year, for example, and the work that they're doing um, on an interagency basis um, to, to really take off and have proposals that can um, be, be out there and explored and perhaps pursued in a Harris administration. And I think that that is something that, uh, that feels like we will, will uh, be a priority going forward. Um, on AI and digital, um, you know, this is a really tough area. There's a lot of competing interests um, on, on, on both of these with respect to um, consumer protection, privacy, uh, security, and the offensive interest that the United States has. On digital, obviously, there's been, um, you know, controversy over the Biden administration's positions, pulling back from some of those um, offensive negotiating positions that had been uh, U.S. policy um, as it evolved over recent years. Um, and, I, and that it feels like we're sort of in a pause now, and that's not really a pause that's sustainable going forward because of the strong interest that the United States has on digital trade policy and as it impacts all of those other issues. So, you know, I think that in a, in a Harris administration, uh, you're going to have to see um, that pause uh, evolve into um, a policy that balances the U.S. strong offensive interests in, in uh, digital trade issues for our companies, um, as well as including artificial intelligence, um, as well as protecting those interests, whether it's regulatory or security, uh, to, um, to 
um, respond to the, the real concerns about these technologies. And it, it's about striking that balance and being out there um, and shaping the conversation rather than being on the sidelines. And I absolutely think that you would anticipate the Harris administration um, entering that space. Now, let me turn to our, our Asian guest. And Gita, maybe I can start with you. Um, you've listened to what Cleet um, and Greta have said. Um, you've also been an astute observer of U.S. politics over the years. Um, how, how do you know what concerns you when you when you listen not only to the, the this discussion but also to broader discussions that are taking place in the United States from both a regional perspective but also from your perspective as you know one of the most important and populous countries um, in Asia, um, being from Indonesia. Over to you, Gita. I think for the benefit of the audience, as, as basic information, Southeast Asia is a region of 700 million people and a collective GDP of $3.3 .3 trillion. And it's safe to say that it's a region that's been able to embrace multipolarity in the last 2000 years by way of its having been graced by Buddhism for 400 years, Hinduism for 600 years, Islam, Christianity, colonization, independence, democratization for the seven to 800 years thereafter. Without too much bloodshed, that I think speaks for the robust ability of Southeast Asia to embrace multipolarity. And if you want to put that in the context of how we see the increasing tension between the United States and China, I think we can look at it from two angles. The first is the, the degree to which some of the leaderships in Southeast Asia are leaning towards. We've seen the Philippines, I think, tilting a little bit more to the US. And then we've seen Malaysia as much as it's been saying lots of things which may not sound too favorable to the US, but it's been able to attract capital formation from the NVIDIAs of the world, the Intels of the world. And the recent election of Prabowo in Indonesia is a manifestation of, I think Indonesia's pendulum or political calculus moving from, you know, call it leaning towards China to leaning towards the US at the rate that Prabowo would have been educated internationally. This is a guy that's gonna be inaugurated on the 20th of October, who speaks French, Dutch, German, English, and Bahasa. I think he has that internationalist instinct to basically score points with the West. And then he has many of us in Southeast Asia, I think have come to the recognition that China has not been a major capital allocator into Southeast Asia. And it put this in an empirical perspective. The Belt and Road Initiative was announced in 2013 for Southeast Asia in the amount of $171 billion. After 11 years, around $20 billion only would have been realized. Far short of, you know, the aspiration. And, and I think this, you know, correlates with what I call, you know, or what the Chinese call the dual circulation economic philosophy, which essentially domesticates its own economic activities as a result of which the ability to export capital from China is somewhat diminished. But the second reason, which I think is much more structural for Southeast Asia, is basically Southeast Asia's inability to provide a much more robust rule of law environment. And this is empirically manifested in how Southeast Asia has been able to attract only about $200 billion worth of FDI every year for the last 10 to 15 years, of which Singapore has been able to attract between 100 to $140 billion, disproportionately more, much more than each one of the other Southeast Asian countries 
with much bigger population sizes, Thailand, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia would attract only about 10 to $20 billion worth of FDI. Indonesia, 26 to $31 billion each year in the last 10 to 15 years. So this is, I think, a reflection of how capital flows from one place to another on the basis of not ideology, not on the basis of geography, but more on the basis of trustworthiness. Singapore has been perceived as a much more trustworthy. So to take this to the next point where one would have thought that there would have been massive reshoring, friendshoring, offshoring from China. There really hasn't been to Southeast Asia because of that deficiency in providing the necessary rule of law with the exception of Singapore. So I would not be too concerned, you know, as to whether it's gonna be a Harris or a Trump administration. And I think the United States under any administration should be more concerned about Southeast Asia's concern with China's flooding Southeast Asia's with its goods and services in a big way, but without actually deploying the necessary economic capital so we can actually build the manufacturing capabilities as an alternative to China. So I would be quite indifferent. And, and I think the leaderships of most Southeast Asian countries would be quite indifferent in terms of whether it's gonna be a Harris or a Trump presidency. And, and I think for the most part, Indonesia's leadership of ASEAN is long awaited by most countries, including that of Singapore. And, and I think a Prabowo presidency that's going to be perceived, at least in my view, as much more leaning towards the West, call it the United States and the other members of the G7, would, I think, provide a balancing type of tone to the overall ASEAN equation under any administration, you know, whether it's a Harris or Trump administration. So the last that I want to say is, I think the most structural thing that's important for Southeast Asia is to get its act together on the rule of law. And to the extent that we can get a rack together on the rule of law, the only allocator of capital right now would be the G7. I don't think it's China. Uh, China has structural limitations by way of dual circulation economic philosophy, and it has been manifested empirically in the Belt and Road Initiative, which has had a realization of only $20 billion in the context of the aspiration of a total of $171 billion in the last 11 years. So it's important, I think, for not just the Philippines and Indonesia, but the Singaporeans, the Malaysians, the Thais, the Vietnamese to realize that you know, if we were to get economic capital allocation, we would have to look at the West a little bit more, but not necessarily totally at the expense of China. Just a, a follow-up, and that would be, there is growing concern um, in the United States that Chinese companies are increasing their investments, not only in Mexico, but in Southeast Asia as well, as in an effort to kind of circumvent the tariffs and export directly to the United States from those countries. Do you think those concerns then are, are overblown? Um, particularly, They are, Wendy. And, and I've, I've given you the numbers, right? The FBI, yeah. I mean, if, if there is reshoring, if there is, call it Chinese French shoring, you would have seen that in the FBI figures. But if you take a look at the FDI, it's been pretty much $200 billion a year. And about 100 to 140 of those would have gone to Singapore. And a lot of that is really portfolio type of capital, capital markets, type of capital allocation. Whereas Indonesia has been only getting 26 to $31 billion. And, and I, if, if you take a look at 15 years ago until 10 years ago, actually the FDI in Indonesia grew by three to 400% from 6 billion to 26. 
whereas the last 10 years, it's only grown by less than 20%. That speaks for capital allocation, not just from China, but from many other countries. And if you take a look at the cumulative, the largest cumulative capital allocator into Southeast Asia in the last 30 to 40 years, it's Japan. You know, it's not China. So, so I, I think the sound bites are, are a bit overblown. Uh, and, and I'm not witnessing meaningful amounts of reshoring from China. So I think the concern about goods and services moving or circumventing through Southeast Asia into the U.S. is a bit misplaced. If you really take a deep look at the FDI formation or the capital formation in Southeast Asia. Thank you. And now over to our Japanese guests. Um, Takamasa, maybe you can share with us Japan's perspective as it looks at our election. What is of concern to Tokyo? I mean, Japan under Prime Minister Abe seemed to handle the Trump administration and his personal relationship with Trump very well. And other countries, my understanding, we used, used to call up Prime Minister Abe to get tips on how to deal with President Trump. But what's on Japan's mind as it looks towards our election and what's of concern in the economic area um, in, you know, with respect to possible new tariffs or with respect to, um, you know, our policies with um, China um, and other area, other related areas as well? Over to you. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Um, uh, that is a very interesting question. And well, actually, when I'm staying in Japan, I hear some voices that is, some Japanese are saying that there is no significant difference between Ms. Harris and Mr. Trump. So probably um, in Japan, we are saying, I mean, the most important thing for Japan about the presidential election is how the new president will, will treat the relationship with China. And if we view from that aspect that Japanese are thinking that there's no significant difference between Ms. Ms. Harris and Ms. Trump. They're both, they share the basic understanding that they're both against China. So we expect that even any candidate, even Mr. Trump or Ms. Harris would be take a very harsh policy towards China. So if that happens, probably the methodology might be different between the, those two candidates, but the basic idea that they're going to take a very strong policy toward China, then we'll say, well, the, the, the difference between the candidates is not so significant anymore. So um, that's the one important thing, to how to treat the relationship with China. And another important concern for Japan is the market access towards, I mean, the access towards the U.S. market. And in this case, we might find a difference between Mr. Trump and Ms. Harris, because we are, we are obvious that Mr. Trump will try to raise the tariffs. So that, that would be the critical issue for Japan. And I think also ASEAN countries are also interested in accessing the US market. For, so for those exporters, the, the tariff rate of the United States is quite important. So if Mr. Trump decided to raise the tariff in 10% or 20% or any numbers, all right. But if, they, if he decided to raise the tariff, that would be the most important, that has a very strong impact to Jap Japanese economy. But again, some people might say there's no significant difference between Mr. Trump and Ms. Harris because even under Harris administration, we might expect that she would introduce many protective measures. Maybe the methodology, again, the methodology might be different. Mr. Trump will try to introduce more border measures, but Ms. Harris might introduce more internal measures like internal tax or internal subsidies and so on. So if the result or the outcome of the, uh, the Ms. Harris administration was the same, then we just say, well, the final, final result is the same. It's just the methodology, border measures or internal measures, that's only the difference, but the impact to other countries might be the same. So again, this might pro 
provoke the um, the statement that there's no significant difference between the, Mr. Trump and Ms. Harris. And but still, I I also have very interesting number here, which is just um, it's an opinion poll just conducted by by um, Japanese newspaper. So it's just a newspaper information, and I don't have the detail about the number. But it is interesting to note that for Japanese. Uh, Seventy percent Japanese people are uh, um, expecting Miss Harris to become next president, and just only twenty percent. Seven zero, seven zero. Seven zero, yes, yeah. seventy, yes. Yeah. And twenty percent is supporting Mr. Trump. So, in the case of Japan, probably the the election, the result of election is obvious, but. But this number is maybe based on the impression by the Japanese, um, by the Japanese, because we have already have some. We know that the, the first Trump administration's impact. So maybe people are more concerned with the Trump administration. But I would like to emphasize that from the perspective of Japan, that probably there are not so significant difference between the two candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe just a follow-up question here that might be of interest to the audience, and that is the proposed acquisition um, by Nippon Steel of U.S. Steel. And, um, you know, both Bi President Biden as well as former President Trump have expressed concerns um, close to opposition to this deal. But there are reports now that, the, that um, you know, the, the decision may be delayed post-election. Is this um, receiving a lot of attention in Japan and causing concern? Um, I, you know, note the government has been pretty quiet about this. But in your circles, what are you hearing about this? Yes, thank you very much. Of course, it's, it has very strong impact because, I mean, it's 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 kind. It might have the chilling effect for the Japanese companies to invest in the United States, so the U.S. steel case is pr pretty important for Japan. And but on the other hand, uh, many Japanese are very confident that the, that that M and A is very beneficial for both Japan and the United States. So even we have some resistance from the government or any um, U.S. administration, but people are believing we should maintain this position, and, and it should it should have some benefit. Or otherwise, if we stop the investment here, as I said, we it might provoke it might cause a chilling effect for other countries. It might provide a bad impression to the other countries. So probably even Japanese government are silent on this issue. The basic idea for um, Japanese companies or people in Japan are thinking that we should promote this M&A. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, maybe I can go back to our US guests who have listened to um, both Gita and Takamasa. And what I took away from both of them was that maybe in their views, there isn't this huge difference between either candidate in terms of the impact in the economic area um, on their economies and, and on the region. Um, but I'd, I'd be very interested to hear your responses to that point, but also any other points that were raised. Cleet, um, over yeah. to you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, really enjoyed hearing the other panelists' comments. And, and I do want to dive on the, down on this particular question here. I do think that we often find ourselves saying, you know, the Harris and Trump strategic objectives won't be all that different. And I think at a high level, that's right. But I do think that there are a couple important differences. You know, one difference that I've noticed is that the Trump administration was before, and I suspect, again, will be much more interested in opening up markets for U.S. companies, you know, fighting for uh, U.S. companies abroad. I think the, the Biden administration has largely been on the sidelines as other countries have discriminated against us on digital issues and agricultural issues. And so I think that will be a difference um, strategically. I also think the-, the before, before that, in, in concrete terms, like what would that mean? Like well, I mean, I, I would look at digital services taxes. I would look at the Digital Marketing Act in Europe. I'd look at the fact that both Korea and Japan are looking at uh, protection as digital measures. And I don't think that the Trump administration is going to stand by uh, while that goes on. 
whereas the Biden administration has totally rolled back those investigations and doesn't seem interested in helping U.S. companies abroad. So I think that's uh, one difference. I think on the flip side, I do expect the the Biden or the Harris team to be much more focused on climate as an objective, um, which I get it. I, I don't deny that climate is a global problem, but I but I worry about us, you know, making that the primary objective of our trade uh, regime. Um, and you know, if you try to do everything, maybe you do nothing well. Um, so I don't. I, I think that's a a, a difference. But what the major difference is really going to be, in my opinion, is on the tactical side, whereas you've had a pretty passive trade policy um, from the Biden administration, and, and I think you would from, from the Harris administration, whereas the Trump administration was very proactive. And, and I suspect they'll be very proactive again. But I want to turn the conversation a little bit away from just tariffs. You know, Trump's a tariff man, make no mistake, but he's also a deal maker. And 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 as I was listening to my colleagues and friends from Indonesia and Japan, you know what struck me is this just this missed opportunity that we have in the region. You know we haven't done a new FTA since 2012. China's doing FTAs and all of this activity in that region, and we're largely on the sidelines. And you know I don't deny that there's some value to IPEF, but it really isn't. Um, changing laws in a meaningful way that's changing the cost calculus for businesses as they're setting up their supply chains. And so that's what we need. And I do think in a Trump administration, there is an opportunity for real deal making in the region where we actually are aligning um, our, our economies in, in a more substantial way. I will just end by saying, though, I think if we can't get to back to the place where we're doing comprehensive FTAs under either Trump or Biden, or sorry, or Harris, we do need to be looking at sectoral deals in a real way. And what I mean by that is two things. On one hand, we find the trusted partners and allies, and we open up each other's markets. We align our standards. We have access to each other's procurement markets. But on the other hand, we also take common action against China. And, and I think Greta alluded to the fact that you can't do it alone. Excess capacity is a global problem. I agree. And so I think what you do is you have these agreements that liberalize among friends and allies and then common external tariffs against China so that they cannot distort those markets. And I think there's potential for that regardless of who wins. I hope so anyway. Mm -hmm. Hey, Greta, I mean, a lot has been put on the table. Do you think there'll be an appetite in a Harris administration maybe for some sectoral deals that might include some trade related provisions um, and how do you respond to kind of some of the comments that our colleagues from Asia put forward with respect to uh, their their views on what a Harris administration would bring on in this sector, in this area? Yeah, thank you. And I might work a bit backwards. Um, uh, so first on sectoral deals, I, I do agree with Klee. I think there's an appetite and growing interest. And, it, it, you know, it just makes sense uh, with the policy objectives that we talked about earlier to think about sectoral deals. And in fact, the Biden administration did some experimentation in this, including the global arrangement on steel and aluminum discussions with the EU. Which you led, you led those that. negotiations, correct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, which was climate and market access and overcapacity related. And so it was all of those things. And it was kind of getting toward the idea that he was saying about having you know, a group of partners that can take collective action, agree on what that is, and um, correct within their markets for the distortion of, of Chinese products and of the um, uh, overcapacity in, in these highly energy intensive products. Um, so that's one. And, and the critical and minerals agreements was also uh, uh, an experiment in a sectoral um, uh, type of agreement. Um, they did have real benefits uh, tied to the Inflation Reduction Act. So I think that the seeds have been planted. It's a new space. So I think you can uh, expect iteration and, and kind of having to think about what these actually look like, what the authorities are in the United States, what are their partners will accept and, and have that evolve. I think it's a really interesting and exciting space. Um, I think he is also right. I think on the tactics, there there is a difference, and uh, President Trump has a very particular tactic, and and you know he's a uh, 
he, he does put threats on the table. Um, and that's uh, often the environment that partners are negotiating under. So it is the threat of raising tariff. It is the threat of, you know, of, uh, of um, coming out of NAFTA. And that's, you know, the kind of the way that he sets the table. And I think that we could expect that, frankly, in the, in the future. I think that a, a Biden-Harris administration, they do try to work more um, cooperatively on these issues. You see various um, groupings of countries to address different issues, whether it's overcapacity or economic coercion um, or, or critical minerals. Um, and so I think that we'll see uh, the engagement just, just look different in that way. Um, uh, I do think there will be more focus on climate, but that that can be linked to market access. Um, and it can be a new way that we're thinking about uh, strengthening the ties with like-minded uh, parties and, and also addressing climate issues similar to those global arrangement um, ideas and conversations that were out there. Um, it, the, the comments from Gita, I mean, it was really interesting to hear uh, because I think, Wendy, you're right, there is this perception that um, China is going out into not just Mexico, but Southeast Asia to avoid the tariffs. And I, I wonder, and I it may be interesting to dig into, you know, even though there is low FDI going to say Indonesia from China, where is that FDI going? Are we seeing, you know, the- In solar which sectors you mean is a concept? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it these sectors that are top of mind for the United States that are high priority areas and also highly contentious with China. And maybe that's overblowing the perception in the United States that, that that's a real trend that's broader, but it's, it's just happening in these very visible to, to policymakers, sectors and, and assets. Um, and, I, and I think also, you know, the, the comment about flooding the, the products uh, of China into places like Indonesia, I think we're seeing a, a really interesting um, spread of what the reaction to that is, right? What are what are countries around the world, Canada, EU, um, India, and others doing to uh, react to the, the products that are coming out of China and have to go someplace? They're not really coming to the United States as much as they otherwise would because of our tariffs, but it's becoming a problem uh, for other countries. And I think that that's evolving the, the conversation that we're having about China and its global impact, not just its bilateral impact. I think this is someplace where the Biden administration has put a lot of uh, time and energy and, and talking in with partners and allies about uh, that bigger picture of, of what China's uh, 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 policy impacts are on the entire world and not just uh, the United States. And a lot of these conversations around, say, economic coercion, where China's power as, you know, either a, a monopoly or, you know, a monopsony, the, the buyer of a product that is so important to, to so many countries, especially agricultural products, but other uh, raw materials and inputs, um, how can countries become more resilient to both, to, to the risks that that poses, both uh, just of disruption in that relationship or that supply chain, but also from pressure from China to um, take certain positions or um, refrain from actions that we've seen play out in other places. And so I think that that, that has been a big focus and an undercurrent of, of some of these conversations. And I think to the extent that there is a vacuum of China's investment and involvement. I mean, that is absolutely a place where, you know, the United States, whatever the administration um, should come in and fill. And I think that there's just a different approach to, to what that means between a Trump and a Harris administration. Um, just quick audience question for you, Greta, and that is what are the prospects in a potential Harris administration for either lowering or eliminating some of the tariffs that are in place that, that particularly in the consumer area, but also um, what are the prospects for even increasing the tariffs more than the recent announcement made by President Biden of the tariff increases that will go into effect on September 27th. Anything you can share with us um, on those prospects? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I frankly wouldn't expect there to be much change in certainly the near term, right? We just had the four year review. We just had a comprehensive look at the tariffs and at the policy and at what China is doing and in the underlying investigation. And this was the outcome. And so I think that it is very unlikely that you would see, you know, within the first couple of years of a Harris administration, major changes here. That said, I mean, I think the, the 301 statute is, is very flexible about making changes. If there's a change on the facts on the ground, um, uh, then that would inform and, and lead to a change in the tariffs, you could see something up or down. But I, don't, I wouldn't see major shifts either way. Um, you know, some of the changes that are phased in are related to thinking about how uh, U.S. investments that are being made um, in part through the Inflation Reduction Act, how long it will take, what what shifts in supply chains are sort of estimated to to um, to bring about over the next couple of years. If those um, estimates change, adjustments could be made. But I think, you know, most of that would be on the margins and we're kind of where we are on this policy, um, you know, for, I think, most, if not all of, of the Harris administration. Okay, we are we are quickly approaching 9 a.m. I wanna get a couple more questions. And Gita, question for you. You've heard both Cleet and Greta talk about maybe the possibility of sectoral agreements in Indonesia in particular as a, as a um, um, you know, very strong and critical minerals. And I understand that there are some discussions going on between Indonesia and the U.S. in this area. Do you, do you it, it, would Indonesia be interested in a critical minerals agreement either with the United States or with a, a broader group of like-minded countries um, as an alternative supply chain to, to or, or to reduce, for us to reduce our reliance on, on Chinese imports of these products? That, that I think would be a welcome idea under the new upcoming administration in Indonesia, given what I've alluded to earlier uh, but but I want to I want to go back a little bit to what Greta uh, was was asking or saying with respect to you know I, I think the real concern here for the US is China that's pretty conclusive right uh, I think the US should not be overly concerned with Southeast Asia as a partner and I, I do believe that, let me go back a little bit. If we take a look at the last 30 years, the GDP per capita for Southeast Asia has only grown for about 2.7 times compared to China's 10 times. And it's highly identifiable among Southeast Asians as to why we underperformed. It would have been on massive underinvestment in education massive underinvestment in infrastructure, lack of governance, and lack of competitiveness. And when I say this, I say this with full cognizance of the fact that Singapore has been the absolute exception. So if the United States would want to be a partner with Southeast Asia, it would have to think about how the United States can be helpful in each one of those attributes. And, I, and I've gone through that you know, negotiation on TPP earlier, right? What, what I've discovered would have been, you know, this high degree of over intellectualization, right? Without actually putting stuff on the table for us. And I had always asked for, you know, some capital allocation for Indonesia and some others in Southeast Asia that were asking through me at that time. But the sentence never carried on as to include you know, economic capital allocation. I think we have no problem with respect to embracing a 22nd century narrative, which would include intellectual property, government procurement, human rights, and all that good stuff, right? But at the end of the day, we've got to sell this idea to the people through parliament. And the only way to sell it is to make sure that those guys know that we're going to get better educated, we're gonna get more money for investments that will allow us to move up the value chain. So in, in answer to your question as to whether or not critical minerals would be a viable 
idea, it wouldn't, in short. But, but I think the concern, it's important for the Americans to understand that the concern for many Southeast Asians is the flooding of goods and services from China, which we're not able to. And if the, the question would have been by Greta would have been about whether there's been any reaction, there is some degree of blowback, political blowback. But I don't think it's at the level where it's going to complicate our relations or relationship with China. I think Southeast Asia, for the most part, would want China to be an economic partner. But Southeast Asia is always trying to figure out how to become a much better partner of the United States. Lastly, I'll say this. I will not mention the names of the countries in Southeast Asia, but I think many would argue and would say that under a Republican leadership in the U.S., it would have been easier because the Republican leadership in the U.S. would have been a bit perceived a bit more transactional. And Southeast Asians like to be more transactional, whereas with a Democratic leadership in the U.S., it was just a little too intellectually charged for some Southeast Asian countries. And, and, and I think, you know, the only guy that understands, you know, the way the Democrats talk would be the Singaporeans. But the other countries, I think, would find it a little bit more difficult to understand. So if a, a Trump presidency comes about, I would predict some leaderships in Southeast Asia would actually be celebrating because they can deal with this guy, as, as, as Cleet had aptly pointed out. But if, if a Harris administration comes about, I think some of us would have to be you know, thinking, okay, we got we to gotta, we gotta get ready for the intellectualization. And I'm, we're not sure if we're going to get anything out of this. And, and you remember Jed P, right? It was announced in November of 2022 at the G20. You all know until today, you know, it was supposed to be for $20 billion for climate initiatives uh, in Indonesia. Nothing has happened because I think the discourse has been a little too intellectual for some of us in Southeast Asia. Interesting. I'm now um, we're running out of time. I want to ask one more question to Takamasa, and that is on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework Agreement. Um, Japan has been very supportive of this agreement. Um, in my pro private conversations, I do sense a bit of a disappointment that the U.S. did not go, cannot, you know, has not been able to go further than IPAF. Um, and I think there's still some in Japan who privately are hoping that the day is going to come when we are going to rejoin CPTPP. But um, let me ask you, how important is IPAF to Japan? And if the U.S. were to withdraw from that agreement after the presidential election, as, as President Trump has alluded to, would this be viewed in the same light as U.S. withdrawal from CPTPP? Or would this be viewed as something less serious because the initiative overall was never viewed as high quality or as high caliber as CPTPP by many in Japan? All right, thank you very much. And you have two minutes to answer that. Yeah, two minutes. All right. I, I feel like it's like a deja vu, you know. Uh, it's, I mean, we're experiencing the same situation with the TPP. And I, I'm thinking IPEF is a quite important framework for not only for Japan, also it's important for the United States. So again, if Mr. Trump decided to withdraw from the IPEF, probably that the same thing might happen in the case of TPP. And I assume TPP and the IPEF can be, you know, they're both supplemental, can make a supplemental situation that they can support each other because the topics are different. And probably some elements. I, I'm thinking that TPP should in, embrace some elements that were developed under the IPEF. So probably they can work together. So um, Japan will promote the IPEF. And then if the withdrawal of IPEF will happen again, I think that situation may cause a very similar situation to the case in the TPP. Thank you. Okay, and with that, it is 9 a.m. Eastern time. I want to just thank the panelists. Great panel. I think we could have gone on for another hour or two. I'm certainly going to reflect on many of the things that were said because I think we had a really rich discussion. So thank you very much to our panelists and thank you very much to our viewers 
And if I did not get to your questions, um, I do apologize. There's just a lot of material on the table for this discussion. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day or evening. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.